This is Global Order. I'm Hindul Sen Gupta. I am delighted to have Colonel Pavitran with me today in this program because he's a he mixes two very unique skills: an army veteran and a cybersecurity expert and an entrepreneur. And I want to talk to him about some critical issues related to technology and military expertise in India, where India is lacking, where India is doing well, what more needs to be done. Colonel, welcome. Thank you, Hindal, for uh, having me on your show. I look forward to this. I want to dive in right to be a colonel and ask you a question that many people are asking. One of the things that the war in Gaza has shown us is that Israel, even with its great technological prowess, has not been really been able to counter the swarm drone attacks that it has been facing. Uh, many people have written that the most sophisticated aerial technologies seem to be failing in many cases. Uh, faced with a $20 drone. You even saw that drone that came from Yemen and fell right at the heart of Tel Aviv. Reflect a little bit about this kind of technological upheaval. How prepared is India? What more could India do? So firstly, regarding uh, the Israeli, um, you know, armies, uh, you know, uh, threats which, uh, you know, they have not been able to counter as far as drones are concerned, which you have mentioned. I... Um, I would uh, slightly differ from your assessment in the sense that um, I don't think it is swarm drones which is the issue. Swarm drones are still, you know, only very few nations are experimenting with those. It works on the principle of bee swarms or insect swarms, where autonomous uh, clouds of, you know, um, drones uh, come and, uh, you know, attack you. That is what is a classically a swarm drone. But these isolated uh, small drones um, are quite very difficult to counter. The one Firstly, from Yemen that fell in Tel Aviv. So I I, I am not uh, particularly count uh, you know count uh, commenting on that because I am not fully aware of this. I have not read up on that particular thing. But drones per se, there are a wide variety of drones from uh, strategic drones to uh, miniature drones, and because of the very nature of uh, uh, medium small uh, miniature drones extremely difficult to detect firstly and uh, uh, even after detection it is difficult to counter uh, classically anti-aircraft guns etc which uh, area denial weapons which militaries are used to do not work against drones because they're too small uh, very difficult to you know and you can't even shoot them down with uh, very difficult to even shoot down them with small arms okay so that's a new paradigm uh, where it can pop up anytime it's very cheap so like you said a lot of them are commercial, which can be repurposed uh, by terrorists, etc. So that is something which has now come onto the battlefield. Um, um, it has been talked about for some time. We first saw it between um, Armenia and Azerbaijan. So it is not that it was not predicted. Uh, but this rapid arrival of drones, um, uh, because it's very cheap and it can uh, cause major damage to uh, major platforms like tanks, etc., seemingly are highly vulnerable. Um, and this remote viewing capability and pinpoint accuracy with which these loitering emanations can hit you has definitely changed the battlefield. Okay, that's one part. Now, your second is about where are we as India? I'm told there are about 900 odd Indian companies which have come up for creating drones. Okay, the number is fascinating when I heard that. Uh, definitely, there has to be a way wherein, you know, there will be a major wipe, uh, wipe out of these drones because these are all uh, people who are assembling various parts, you know, and then creating their own drones. Um, and uh, that's per se not so a bad idea when you initially start up an industry. Uh, but um, in warfare, you cannot have that, that sort of kits because uh, usually certain parts, uh, you know, in uh, traditional uh, in warfare in the, industry, in, in the information age, people can remotely control. You cannot use someone else's drone against themselves because those nations are, uh, uh, you know, uh, bound to, you know, put intelligence and uh, or compromise the information communication technology through which it is controlled so that uh, others don't use it against them. Uh, so to that extent, uh, the Indian companies, how much have they been able to indigenize the paths? Okay, from starting from the motors to sensors to the control elements to the autopilot, etc. is where the key is. And that is where is the challenge. So I feel that uh, although we have announced an Atmanirbhar policy, uh, I see it as a uh, not a comprehensive way to handhold indigenous technologies. 
Um, you yourself have been an entrepreneur and you have studied, and I'm told that you write or written a book on entrepreneurship. So you will know that, um, you know, a license Raj method of hand-holding innovation is bound to fail, okay? Because of the very human nature of, uh, you know, our interactions. So what we need is, uh, and what we have seen globally is, people have created venture capital funds, strategic venture capital funds to handhold. And this present budget, the government of India has created such a strategic venture capital fund for our space sector, okay? But in the defense sector, that venture capital fund is not there. They've got something called IDEX, they've got various other schemes, which I don't think might be fast enough or agile enough and uh, comprehensive enough to handhold our in, in, you know, indigenous uh, technologies. Back to you. I also wanted to, to ask you, uh, you know, when you look at this, I'm glad you mentioned this entire military indigenization process. Reflect a little upon this because you're right, of course, that no country the size, especially the size and scale of India with the kind of security challenges that India faces can hope to become a you know great power, even, you know, establish its rising power credentials unless it substantially can take care of its security with its own sort of homegrown methodologies and weapon systems. It can't, you know, it can't forever uh, protect its sovereignty by borrowed and bought weapons from elsewhere. Uh, therefore, defense indigenization is very important to us. And we, we seem to be doing, you know, we seem to be doing a lot of work there. We've begun uh, exporting missiles and so on and so forth. But I want you to reflect about the, on this as somebody who's deep into this work on how far our military indigenization process is really working. Uh, what is working? What is not working? What more needs to be done? One thing you mentioned, of course, is this VC fund for military uh, affairs or military purposes, which I thought was very interesting. What more? Uh, how successful is our military indigenization process at the moment? Like I mentioned, we are exporting missiles and so on and so forth. What more needs to be done and what is missing? Okay, so uh, when you look at India and the rest of the world, firstly, I'm glad, uh, Hindol, that you have also uh, zeroed in on the fact that a nation the size of India cannot choose the paths which other nations have, many other smaller nations have chosen because of the inherent nature of the global order, okay? Where uh, at the top, the, uh, India cannot rise economically or militarily without affecting the global order. That's the first realization, which I don't think is much voiced uh, within um, India. I don't know why it is not so. Because um, people have got, uh, you know, from an economic background, or the economists seem, seem to be who are mostly trained in the West are the ones who are ruling the rules. And I constantly see articles on why we should follow that or why should we follow this. Um, that might not work, uh, you know, because we need to um, holistically look at what is India, what is this nation all about, what are its strengths, what are its weaknesses, and uh, what, uh, will other nations try to um, influence or prevent us from rising. Okay, I don't think such an exercise has been carried out uh, in uh, modern Indian. Uh, not too much. Okay, some odd commentator might have made statements, including like me. But we need to firstly have that study, and we need to have a national, uh, you know, security doctrine in place after doing that study. There are people who have said that we have a national security doctrine, but it is not uh, declassified. What is the point of having a secret? doctrine wherein uh, different arms of the government uh, have no access to it and we cannot the the citizens cannot hold them accountable for actions which you know they are, they have not done for example let me now try to you know come back uh, you know explain this with an example you know that our uh, core networks ict ne networks um, are controlled by um, uh, chinese technologies oi and ct okay BSNL. So it was a PSU who bought and over two, three decades, they are hugely entrenched in the in the Indian this. But if a holistic study had been done, uh, someone would have marked, uh, you know, highlighted it, which I'm told that they did on a uh, in newspaper reports that security agencies constantly warned that we should not go down this path. Okay. But in spite of this, we did go down that path. And today we have uh, our armies mobilized on our borders, the Chinese army and our army. It's not a very com uh, comfortable uh, this knowing that the Chinese control your core ICT networks. Okay, we are, you know. Now comes about um, 
R and D in defense technology. Now, which are the organizations uh, which do R and D in India um, uh, for defense as well as civil sectors? What is the track record? And this track record needs to be um, examined with respect to other parts. What has been their track record? And what is the reasons why uh, India, whether if it has performed well, and if it has not performed well, that needs to be evaluated. Okay. Uh, Indian human resource talent is undoubtedly global, uh, you know, uh, world class. A um, lot of Indian citizens who migrate abroad have done exceptionally well in science and technology. So it is not the science, uh, the brains which matter, it is a process, it's the policies which is a failure. Okay, because we don't, uh, do not seem to have created a viable system because we have been largely import dependent in all our critical uh, you know, systems. And even in that, if you look at it, um, nations, when they import uh, defense technology, we are one nation which seems to have imported from all across the spectrum. Okay. So, uh, I don't want to just dive into it in full this, but we will at some point of time, will end up antagonizing at least, because all these people from whom we have imported today are going for conflict. Okay, different parts of it are going for conflict. So during times of our conflict, we today are not confident who is going to stand with us and who is going to stand against us. Okay, um, that's where we are today. So now I dive back into the um, uh, innovation ecosystem. Firstly, we need to look at, can innovation happen under the government financial regulations? Okay, so what exactly is the government financial regulations is where the government decides that, okay, this is the way your finances will be spent. So for any project, what you do is you write a note, you justify it, it goes through the FA and it comes back. Now, innovation is a very agile process where you have to be very agile uh, on technologies to what is happening, etc. So once you start off on a particular line after justifying it, and if things do not go, if you have to go back to the FA and justify, usually people ask, okay, this much of money has been spent. Uh, who is responsible for the wastage? If you are now going to ask for fresh budgets or going to have, that's where, you know, innovation is uh, in government is not very agile. So if you look at, for example, other democratic nations, the uh, biggest example is DARPA. What, what do they have? They don't have too many employees. Okay. They don't employ anyone permanently. They have a budget which is similar if you look at to our DRDO budget. Okay. In dollar terms. But if you compare, um, uh, you know, um, in the IMF model, uh, that one dollar goes much more in India than it goes uh, in the US. So if you compare that model, our budget is actually many times larger than DARPA. Okay, I have written about this. But when you compare the sort of innovations which DARPA has come up with and what we have been able to do, uh, you will find a huge uh, you know, uh, difference. Why is that so? Because if the difference is the difference in the system. It is not, uh, you know... Uh, I have met, uh, met and dealt with a lot of DRDO scientists. Many of them are world class. And many of them are very sincere people. But they get defeated by the process. Okay, when you join, and then it slowly becomes the culture of that organization. Because uh, the culture develops of an organization. And when p uh, new people start joining, they get absorbed into that particular culture. So what we need to do is to examine why a DARPA model is successful. And the DRDO, I wouldn't say it's a failure but it doesn't seem to be able to compete with the DARPA, okay? So, and then we need to take a call on as a nation, which direction do we need to go? But have we done that? I doubt. Now, even in this innovation, this, I've mentioned this before, our entire defense innovation is under uh, a secretary of the, uh, under one of the secretaries of in the MOD, who also heads the entire DPSUs, okay? The DPCOs also are supposed to be competitors of private innovators. So this, I think, might not be a very good policy. This, if you are going to, you know, uh, make a, make up a new class of innovators which are going to uh, challenge your own existing this, there is bound to be a challenge. Okay, this is simple. This, and I think we need to have a relook at this. We need to, you know, think of why conflict of interest, etc., might not scar our um, journey. Because we are today at a stage, um, um, at a point in history where, uh, you know, next 
10 generations will be dependent on what decisions we do today. And we are not in a very comfortable state. Back to you. Well, I also wanted to ask you, um, you know, since you mentioned, uh, and very interestingly, the level of Chinese involvement in our national ICT processes, information communication technology processes, you know, G uh, General Dipinder Hoda was talking to me on this very platform a few days ago, and he used to be head of Northern Command. And he mentioned that, uh, you know, one of the things that worries the most is the extent to which the Indian Navy might be using uh, Chinese communication or radar systems. He also mentioned that he had tried to push for indigenization of communication systems in the Northern Command, but faced systemic pushbacks which was a problem and which you're also mentioning. Uh, talk to us, uh, talk to me a little bit about how big is this problem and why we are not able to resolve it. How big is the problem, for instance, of Chinese involvement in our critical uh, technological infrastructure, including military infrastructure? Okay, so I did listen to your uh, General Huda's podcast on your platform, but I don't recall he talking about any Chinese uh, radar systems which is being used by the Indian Navy, frankly. Uh, but that oh, said, he mentioned he mentioned that the Indian Navy is using many communication tools still, which are uh, not, not Chinese. maybe necessarily of China. I doubt whether they right. are doing. Uh, in my own, uh, this is uh, the Indian Navy has been quite proactive because it's a builder's navy. Among the three sister services, the Indian Navy has been slightly uh, much ahead of both the Army and the uh, Air Force as far as indigenization is concerned. Okay, this as an Army man, I you know I frankly concede uh, they were ahead. Um, secondly, um, you know regarding indigenize, uh, you know, but that said, our uh, military communication to a large extent, you know, I don't think is uh, it is not indigenous at all. Okay, we are dependent on various crit uh, critical technologies on foreign countries. And then finally, today, when it comes to data, we are, you know, the, no military can be independent of the civil infrastructure of that parent nation. The ICT is like the nervous system of a nation. So you cannot have a military which says, okay, the rest of the nation is uh, not uh, secure, but we are secure. No way is it possible. The uh, shared nervous system is a huge vulnerability. Until very recently, in fact, even today, the Indian military, I think, is wrongly post Snowden keeps talking about air gap networks, which I feel is a uh, big fallacy, and we need to get out of that. And I understand the reason why they say air gap, because if they don't accept that there is an air gap, although there are military uh, chiefs who have accepted that this air gap is not notional, they are on record in saying so, because if you accept that the air gap is notional, uh, then you are in big trouble. Because your entire nervous system is owned by others. Such a military can be easily owned in the information age. Okay, You can be monitored, your data can be altered, it can also be switched off at will. Uh, this is where we are today. And uh, like, like we said, since your program is called Global Order, India is not a small cog in the global order. It is a big cog. Its latent potential is what makes other nations wary of India. If you rise economically under one political dispensation, you will have huge, humongous budgets to concentrate on securing your interests. Okay? People see that. Will they allow you to just rise like that? If you allow your data and your information communication technologies to be owned by other nations, would they hamper that rise intelligently by creating social cohesion issues in such a varied nation? Will they be able to um, you know, manipulate your political process, elect leaders which they want you, uh, uh, want you to elect? Uh, elect? Will, they be able to, uh, will you be able to remain a sovereign uh, republic? I doubt. Okay. Uh, but then why are we not taking corrective steps? So, uh, to be fair, the government seems to be seized of the problem and they have come with Atmanirbar. Okay? But just having Atmanirbar will not suffice. You need to have laws also to support and policy initiatives to support, which people like me are saying is still not coherent. But I am sure that the government is of right mind and uh, their mind is to work for uh, national interests. But 
as citizens we can't be ignorant of these things okay what is the what are the challenges which are going to face us because it is not go, not going to be only the government which is going to face its challenges all of us are going to face it and like i said what decision we take today the next 10 generations will have to face and what our pre previous generations have taken decisions 10 generations previously is where we find you know we at a crossroads so that responsibility and a feeling of history i think is sadly lacking in a nation like india okay it's quite right um you know two things that you mentioned are of course absolutely true india doesn't have a explicitly detailed comprehensive national um you know defense strategy or military strategy or security strategy however you want to call it i mean this is almost you know as, as some officers have told me it's become a bit of a mythical beast you know but decades we've been talking about it it's still not there and whether it's exists in a sort of uh, you know secret form or not uh, unclear but yes the other thing of course which you correctly point out is that the indian broader public in what we call the public sphere lacks a sense of urgency or understanding about what of what of what our sovereignty challenges really are so both absolutely with you you're absolutely right on that i also want to ask you because you're talking about you know different kinds of vulnerabilities there has been concern that india has been facing even in its military infrastructure certain kinds of cyber attacks which it is increasingly vulnerable to and it's already facing but is not being able to counter effectively number one do you think that that assessment is correct number two if yes what more could india do hmm as far as cyber attacks on indian military systems are concerned now the indian military says that they are air gapped okay they are not exposed but indian military personnel always are not um, like i said independent of the indian military and ict systems uh, penetrate deep into all military establishments whether it is cctvs whether it is uh, radars whether it is uh, you know um, radar systems and even platforms which are imported can they be compromised are they streaming data directly back into your information systems uh what are your information systems existing on after snowden what are the initiatives which have been taken up by the nation to ensure that we create a indigenous industry uh what are the platforms which are the uh, which have been identified as being compromised what are the laws other nations are create, uh, you know trying to create i don't see that we have done this you know we have what we have have is newspaper reports about oh some sailors in some place has you know a huge number some of them say the full number has not come out they all been honey trapped that's a, a word which has come out so this honey trapping of one individual can compromise a compromise a honey trapping of a few dozens of individuals can it compromise i don't know but we have an indication as far as the attack on the power grid in mumbai was concerned okay therein a us company pointed out that the mumbai power grid was brought down by a chinese attack but what did our organizations do firstly they said no there is no attack then they say it was uh, uh, equipment failure or trip uh, it tripped um, and finally they reluctantly agreed when the american company insisted that there is a breach uh today yes it is widely accepted that there was a breach and some compromise did take place now um military uh, we have a tendering system and a open purchase system like if you want to buy wheat there is a tender for buying wheat in the military uh someone wills the tender goes l1 and they supply the wheat can that same standard be applied for buying ict equipment so that means one year before uh, nations and other companies will come to know you want so many so much of this someone will quote l1 and that l1 can be played because if there is a intelligence agency of a nation says okay buy whatever means i need to ensure this particular product goes in and they lower the price so that will become l1 and when it becomes l1 and then you supply after about 6 months that whole process takes some time no you get time is that the way to 
you know, buy your ICT equipment. That looks amazing, no, Post Norden? We have had no change on these things. So, oh, so, I mean, you know, this is the dreaded L1 system, you know, which everybody complains about. But somehow, barring a few notable examples, nobody seems to be able to cure it. I mean, you know, this is a... Uh, it is not only the L1, it is the open, uh, you know, uh, public procurement policy itself. Okay. Uh, you know, you can't apply the same thing for apples and oranges. But wheat, fine, can be an open tender. But buying L... You know, ICT equipment, can it be an open tender? So I'll leave it to you. And maybe uh, with this, your audience might get sens sensitized. Uh, I have one last question for you, Colonel, uh, because we're talking about uh, various kinds of technologies. And I wonder whether you have a position in this. One of the most complicated kind of technologies that in India is investing in, as far as indigenization is concerned, is building nuclear submarines, which are anyway one of the most complex things to build in the world. Um, you know, some people feel that this is, a, and it's of course very expensive. Uh, some people feel that these are weapons of the past. You know, a nuclear submarine will not do for you what it did in the past. There are other ways of ensuring second strike capability and so on and so forth. Uh, whereas, of course, others believe that, no, it's absolutely necessary. Uh, the nuclear submarine is absolutely pivotal in the nuclear triad. You need it to ensure, you know, second effective second strike capability and deterrence. This is very, very critical. I wonder whether, since you have this wonderful background of technology and being a military veteran, do you have a position on this yes and all although i'm an army man uh, i basically i'm a military man so we do look at i might not know the intricacies of submarine warfare but it looks like open and shut case to me i don't think uh, even today the submarines have gone out of fashion and nuclear submarines uh, india does need to because it gives certain advantages you know compared to a conventional submarine which i won't go into the details of but like i said a nation like india uh, with the sort of threats which it's uh, which it can potentially face, it would be very very myopic not to have your own nu nuclear submarines. And there is a reason why nuclear submarine technology is not easily accessible. Okay, if something was harmless, it would have been easily accessible. Uh, even in a defense, you know, a, 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 a market where you are ready to pay huge amounts of money, if that technology is not accessible. It is because other nations who have the technology has realized it is strategic in nature and can make them vulnerable. So by that very, very commonsensical argument my, uh, itself, I can tell you that we need to make our own. There is no other way. That nuclear submarine uh, technology is, uh, you know, as far as I am aware, at present a day, this is the only guaranteed way of a second strike capability. And we have nuclear adversaries on of, on uh, on our borders, yeah. and we can't not afford to take those precautions, especially when they have a nuclear submarine yeah. uh, capability. Yeah. Very well said, uh, Colonel. I cannot uh, let you go though without one last question, which is uh, there is this wonderful story about how you caught an ISI, uh, you know, spy using a cyber cafe in India uh, back in the day uh, and managed to crack, uh, you know, ISI networks to catch a spy uh, operating in India uh, using a cyber cafe. Could you end then this wonderful conversation by telling us that story and also by telling us what's the, there is a moral, according to me, at least in that story about how people can be more cognizant about the security needs of the nation. But perhaps you can tell us what, according to you, is the moral of that wonderful story. Okay, this ISA agent caught from a cyber cafe, I think I have told the story a couple of times. So uh, it's very difficult to keep repeating that story. Was the broad let me, uh, but let me put it in this way. Today, I look at this, uh, you know, at that time, I did not realize it. It was about initiative and imagination okay i since i did not know that field and i just stumbled into it um it was i was just exploring and uh and innovating okay um and i also had an angel funder because the system was not responding so to that extent if you look at it from a technological perspective that is what was happening i had a problem to solve 
I stumbled onto a way to do it. And I found an angel who, a funder who decided to back me up. That it resulted in success, bread for the success is how I will put it. Okay, so the, to that extent, okay, I might have been one of those early entrepreneurial talents within the military system. Year was this, sir? Okay, this journey started, I think, in 2002, 2003. Yeah, 2002 or 2003 was the first time when I stumbled onto this particular thing. And um, I was totally a newbie to computers because I, I was an infantryman uh, for a long time, cut off from modern ways of life other than the annually which I used to get, where I used to get glimpses of this is how the world is going. But my life was in rural, mountainous, um, okay, battling east. And my exposure to the ICT world was very, very limited. So to that extent, yes, I think when I look back, I pat myself, okay, I was lucky, I did. And uh, things worked out for me. Oh, one last point. What is the moral of the story according to you as far as you know, ordinary people and their concern about national security? So national security uh, evolves. It's a concept which evolves with time. And these are times which are troubled times, but although, uh, and also exciting times. In the next two to three decades, Decades, the world is going to undergo much more rapid changes than what has happened in the last 200, 300, century, uh, 200, 300 years. Okay, Now, that change will definitely have uh, things which will affect the battlefield. And uh, the Indian, um, the military is you know, all over the globe are slightly conservative in nat uh, nature and not so agile to change. So, the future will belong to militaries who are awake, and agile to change. So it's going to be like a company. Military usually are bound by tradition, you know. People very get very get a regiment. My, you know, I'm an infantryman, I'm an armored man, I'm a gunner. You will need to think. I'm not saying that you uh, these th uh, these particular uh, arms will not be relevant in a military field, or for that matter, fighter pilots or transport pilots. But when you look ahead, the world is going to go for uh, robotics uh, and maybe you know the fighter pilot might uh, uh, the last fighter pilot might have already been born is my you know when you look ahead in the coming decades it will definitely be dominated by uh, you know robotic planes uh, the future infantry soldier might be um, initially a mix of human versus, versus the rob robo and then might be totally robotic uh, swarm drones etc no way can that swarm be, you know, that is going to be, you know, insect swarm is uh, evolution of uh, millions of years of, uh, you know, biological life, a very potent way of fighting, you know. And I think those things are going to come and only a military which is thinking ahead, who not only can imagine that particular battlefield, work very closely with an industry which is indigenous, find ways other than the procurement, uh, you know, Bibles through today, which you are, uh, you know, stuck, you will have to very rapidly and agilely change your own methods of procurement, handholding, and innovating. That is a military which is going to win. And unfortunately, uh, you know, unfortunately, see, we have been uh, for a long time comparing ourselves with the Pakistan army, which is a society a couple of decades behind us, uh, you know, in innovation. And we are going to compete with a nation which is a couple of decades ahead of us in innovation. Okay, so we don't have much time. We need to, uh, you know, do it much more rapidly. And I come on such shows to evangelize that particular concept. And maybe Hindol, you know, these uh, you know talk shows might be heard by the next generation who will come ahead and do better than what we could. I'm absolutely sure that indeed that is the case and that will be true. Thanks very much, Colonel, for your time. Really appreciate you taking time off and having this elaborate conversation with us to explain many details. Thank you. Thank you, Hindal. Uh, it, was, it was indeed a pleasure to be on your show and talk with you. Thank you.